Hi guys, thanks for stopping by today. I've got another story I want to tell you today, and uh, this one's going to be a little bit choppy, and we're going to jump around because I'm going to take it from her own words. And what we're going to do today is talk about, there's us, that's not who we're going to talk about. Um, we are going to talk about my maternal great great grandmother, and her name is Sarah. Zervia Southworth Burbank, and this is her right here. You can see that she's holding a fan. She is my maternal great-great-grandmother, and sitting uh, in the chair next to her is Daniel Marcus Burbank, who is my maternal great-great-grandfather, and the young man standing next to him is Chester Southworth Burbank, who is my maternal great-grandfather, okay? And uh, we're going to talk about a little bit about uh, both of the uh, Daniel Marcus and Sarah, uh, Sarah uh, Southworth today, and uh, hopefully you'll find that uh, to be of some interest. So, um, to get started here, uh, the history that we're going to uh, share with you was written in her own words when she was 89 years old and she did not have glasses. And uh, uh, this was contributed by one of her great-great-grandchildren. So um, it does jump around a bit, but uh, bear with me. I think you might find this uh, to be of some interest here. Um, it starts off in her own personal uh, writings. She actually says the following. I want to write these things that I have seen and heard for my children and great-children, great, great my children and grandchildren to read in years to come. It will be interesting to them when I have passed away. And I'm just going to jump down to the very end because she closes with this. My father, Daniel Burbank, nope, that wasn't it. Um, I don't see it right now. Um, in the closing, she says that Daniel Marcus and I are now the uh, parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents of over 300 people. Uh, that number has grown uh, geometrically over the years, so uh, I haven't taken the time to count up all the, the answer, you know, all the, the posterity that she has, but it's well over 300, and uh, we're actually a part of that. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about her. And this, is, uh, this is, again, from hers. Uh, she says she was born in 1835 in Upper Canada, uh, in Leeds, Ontario. Uh, her parents joined the church when she was very, very small. And they sold their home and went to move with the saints to Missouri. However, the mob met them as they were going there and told them that if they did not go back, uh, they would kill them all right there on the spot. So they passed by uh, and went on to uh, Kirtland, Ohio, and uh, where the first temple was built. She says there were wicked mobs who stole our goods. Uh, as my father was a rich man, he brought a great deal of things from his lovely home in Canada together uh, with the Latter-day Saints. They said they suffered a great deal of persecutions uh, at the hands of the mob. Um, she goes on and then tells about how Joseph was uh, uh, captured and uh, put in prison, um, uh, driven away, children were crying for bread. She says she was one of those children. When she was eight years old, she says, I was eight years old when I saw the prophet Joseph Smith first. I have been in his store and bought many things for my parents. We lived not far from his house on Mulholland Street, and I have heard him preach along with his brother Hiram and have shaken hands with both of them at Sunday school. That was kind of interesting. Um, it says, I've been to the Nauvoo Temple when it had some of the rooms finished. My parents had their endowments there, and so did my husband, Daniel Marcus Burbank, whom I married while crossing the plains on our way to Salt Lake City. And we're gonna to get to that story in just a minute. Um, it says, my father's name was Chester Southworth, and my mother's name was Mary Byington. Uh, she was born in Canada, in the county of Leeds, and was born in 1811, and died at the age of 87. My father died at the age of 82, and uh, he was born in 
New York State near Ontario, uh, Ontario Lake. Uh, and then there's a, a side note here that says uh, he should have, he was actually born in Connecticut, uh, but there's a, a, a footnote here that says Sarah Burbank was very old when she wrote her life story, so some of her dates are slightly wrong as to the exact time. Um, Daniel Marcus Burbank, his first wife's name was Abigail Church, and she died and left three children. Um, and uh, going on, that talks about their children a little bit. I'm going to skip some of this. Um, it says, finally, we were driven from Kirtland to far west Missouri, and again to Caldwell, Missouri, and from there to Montrose, Iowa, and later to Nauvoo, Illinois. Um, and now she goes in and starts talking about leaving Nauvoo and going west. In this flight, we had to cross the Mississippi River at night on a flat boat to save our lives. The people were camped by the river, some of which were without tents, and many were sick and some dying. We did not know where we were going, but got word from Brigham Young that we were going west. We then went to Mount Pisgah and stayed there all winter. Father made shoes to get flour, bacon, and groceries so we could go again uh, to Council Bluffs where the saints were settled for the winter. <coughs> Excuse me. Later they moved to the town called Canesville, and they were uh, going there with uh, some of their family and her sister, Mary Ellen, uh, who had been born in Nauvoo, uh, actually died in Canesville, and uh, he says she was buried by a lone tree by the uh, roadside. We went on, and we never saw her grave again. She was six years old when she died, and uh, when we were moving to Missouri, my little brother, uh, his name was Robert Luther, uh, was uh, lived only for a few months, uh, died from an, an attack of croup, and was buried by the roadside. We were driven by the mob, and we never saw his grave again. And this was one of the trails, my uh, trials my parents had to endure. Uh, while in Council Bluffs, uh, this is in Iowa, Father built a cabin of logs and a chimney of sod cut in squares of mud with grass on one side, laid up like adobe. Uh, the ground served as the floor, and a door was made of slabs and a window of cloth. We lived there for two years. Now, a lot of times you think about the pioneers uh, making the trek west. Um, Sarah Southworth, it took her several years to actually get across the plains, and I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, we were working to go west. Uh, while they were there uh, in Council Bluffs, they raised corn, potatoes, and had a, a garden. Father made shoes and boots from the little uh, leather he had on hand and sold them to strangers for flour. We were working our way west. I worked for 50 cents a week, is what Sarah says. I was spinning rolls of wool on a wheel to make yarn for clothes. I spun 20 pounds of rolls into yarn for a lady. Uh, I was still not even 15 years old. Later, I worked in a boarding house for a dollar a week and obtained clothes to start on the journey west. From the place we crossed the Mississippi, Missouri on the flat boat, one wagon at a time. The oxen were chained to the wheels. This was the manner that they crossed the river. In June, they camped at winter quarters, uh, where they were organized into companies of 50. And her captain was Daniel Marcus Burbank. Um, they went on her journey among the Indians. At night, they had to guard the oxen so they would, the Indians wouldn't steal them. And the bugle was sounded in the morning, and all the camps were called together for prayer. The cows were yoked with the oxen, and they traveled many miles before getting wood and water. On the first part of the journey, they came to a stream of water. Uh, they found willows to make bridges so they could take the wagons across. When they came to the stream, when they came to a stream, uh, they'd wash their clothes and dry them out on the grass. Uh, she said, "For we didn't know we might not get a chance again for fifty or a hundred miles to wash the clothes." We gathered and dried dung or buffalo chips to make a fire and to cook our food. We would dig a hole in the ground, put the skillet in the hole, uh, and light it with the lid on, and put the buffalo chips on the lid and set it on fire. It baked the bread just fine, she says. That was the way we did our cooking until we got to where there was wood. 
Then we went along the Platte River where we had cholera. Uh, people would get sick from the bad water, and five of their camp uh, had died. Um, she had another, uh, says her youngest sister, um, was born on the plains. Uh, my oldest sister gave birth to a baby, as did many of the other women, women, but the company was not hindered in their march, as they would move on in the next morning, which made for quite a hardship for the mother. Um, now, we talked about Daniel Marcus Burbanks. He was the captain of the, of the company. His wife, Abigail, died of cholera near Sweetwater, Nebraska, on the Platte River. Uh, she was 41 years old when she died and was buried without a coffin along the Platte River with uh, many of the others who had died the, during the night of the disease. They had to go on in the morning, never to see those uh, graves again. The night that uh, Marcus, uh, Daniel Marcus's first wife died, um, they were buried, the wolves were howling, and uh, it was awful, she said, to hear the dirt being thrown onto the bodies. As a young lady, uh, she was asked if she would be willing to wash and dress the body. Uh, and because of the cholera, there were a lot of people that were afraid to, to want to touch the body. But she said she would be willing to do that. And so they dressed her in her underclothing in a nightgown. And then they sewed the body up in a sheet and, um, and a quilt. And uh, that was done. Uh, that was basically all they could do. And the women were afraid. Uh, of catching, but she was 16 years old at the time, and she said that she was okay with doing that, so she did. So they moved on. Uh, about two months after uh, Daniel Marcus's wife, Abby, died, um, Sarah Zariah Southworth married Daniel Marcus Burbank on the Plains. And uh, one of the other uh, company captains uh, that was camped nearby married them one evening. Uh, the bugle called and uh, called the camps, and they came together to witness the marriage, it says. Uh, they had cedar torch lights instead of candles, and it was by the Green River in September, um, on September 10th of 1852 was when that marriage took place. Um, uh, she says she mothered four children that were sick with scar scarlet fever. Um, these, I think, were the first children. Uh, from the first wife that uh, she then became the, the stepmother for. Um, so there was a lot of acts, and I guess that there was quite a quite a bit of trouble. Now, one of the interesting stories that she tells is that uh, about a hundred Indians came riding in, and they actually captured Daniel Marcus Burbank and rode off with him. So the captain was now gone. Uh, she says we thought for sure he would be killed, but then the chief came back and gave him up if the camp was willing to give up flour, sugar, and coffee. Well, they gladly did, made the exchange, and uh, Daniel Marcus was able to come back alive and uh, said he had gone out to hunt buffalo uh, that he had uh, seen through a uh, looking glass, uh, and he had killed the buffaloes uh, before when uh, hunting for a camping place, and it was then that uh, they, the Indians caught him. Uh, she talks about cows uh, furnishing milk because the water was so bad and so far between. Uh, if it hadn't have been for that milk, they would have suffered very greatly. Uh, they had to grind parched corn in their coffee mills uh, to eat with the milk uh, so they could save the flour. It says, we would eat uh, the ground corn in our milk at night. We parched a sackful before we left home. I stood over the fireplace and helped uh, the mother parch it. So that was one of the things they did in preparation before going. Uh, she talks about uh, oxen stampeding, uh, wagons overturning. Uh, I mean, this was uh, when fording streams, we could see the oxen's backs and horns, and they thought for sure the wagons would go under, but they were kept alive only by the help of the Lord. Uh, so this was not an easy trip at, at all for a young lady. Who was now uh, in her late teens and now a, a mother of four children and uh, struggling with disease and all kinds of things. She says, now I can tell you where I was baptized. Uh, and again, we're going back to eight years old, Nauvoo, Illinois, um, just below the Joseph Smith's house in the Mississippi River. Uh, Elder Lauren Farr confirmed me on the banks of the Mississippi River 
and Elder Chauncey West had baptized me. Um, then when we got into the Valley of Springville, all the camp had to be rebaptized. That was the order of President Brigham Young. He said this was done, that all our sins might be washed away after our long, tired journey to Salt Lake. So I've, I've read other accounts where a lot of the saints were rebaptized upon entering uh, the Utah, and I thought that was interesting. Um, when Sarah was 15 years old, she went to a special school and learned how to braid straw hats. And she would braid and sew these hats for a dollar a piece. And she says, after I got married, I made hats for all my children and for many others for years and sold them. She says, I learned to make hats in Mavu and made and sold hats on the steamboats that were on the Mississippi River. Um, I thought that was interesting. Um, Just going to skip down here. Talks about going past the temple, uh, the Nauvoo temple, while it was being built. I used to go past the temple and watch the men working on it. After the temple was finished, the saints held meetings in it for a short time. Men worked on the temple with nothing to eat but cornbread and bacon. Then to see it burned to the ground after working so so long was a very hard trial. Um, she talks then about the. Uh, Joseph and Hiram being killed, um, about Brigham Young then uh, uh, taking the place of the prophet Joseph, leading the saints west. Interesting story about uh, after Joseph and Hiram were brought back from Carthage, uh, she says, um, people came by the thousands and they, there was a funeral that was held for Joseph and Hiram. However, it was a mock fool, uh, funeral to fool the mobs. The the caskets were filled with sand because of threats that their bodies would be dug up. And uh, I thought, thought that was interesting. Um, Daniel Marcus, uh, she talks about, used to be one of the uh, guards that used to guard the prophet's home uh, in Mavu. And uh, he used to help to hide the prophet away uh, when the mobs threatened him. Um, Daniel Marcus uh, had studied medicine or was working in a hospital in St. Louis for a long time. And uh, Sarah tells the story of uh, when Emma was very sick one time, the prophet's wife, the doctor had kind of given up, and so Daniel Marcus went to uh, visit. And he says, I think I can help her. And he went to the store, uh, which might have been even the prophet's store. He picked up some medicine, and for two days... And for two nights, he stayed right by Emma Smith's side and was able to nurse her back to health. Um, uh, da, da, da. It says, Then the prophet told Brother Burbank to gather all his books together and to tend for all the ladies that were in confinement. Um, the prophet said that this was his mission on earth to attend to the sick. And uh, it says that she herself was also given that same blessing that she was here on this earth to attend to the sick. And she writes here, I have delivered over 900 women, and I have had many great testimonies in this church and for caring for the sick. Uh, I thought that's quite a, quite a legacy there to, to serve as a midwife for, uh, for over 900. Uh, uh, that, that's, that's, a, that's an incredible thing. Um, two other stories I just wanted to share with you. Um, Sarah Zerbiah uh, Southworth Burbank um, had a nickname. They called her Curly Grandma because she had this very curly hair. And uh, if you look at some of the other photos of her, you can see that she had uh, some mullet. Um, she tells the story that uh, on her way to school in Nauvoo, uh, she would have been still in the elementary age, uh, she says uh, she remembers passing by the prophet's store on her way to school. The prophet Joseph would ask her if she, if she had enough lunch in her bucket for him too. And she would say, I'm afraid not for the two of us. Then he would say, okay, how about giving me one of your curls then? And the answer would be, I'll have to ask mother. And I thought that was kind of interesting that uh, the prophet Joseph would joke with her about her uh, 
her curly hair. I thought that was kind of a neat story. The one other thing that uh, she mentioned is that I guess uh, serving as a bodyguard, I guess Daniel Marcus was uh, an individual who was uh, quite fit and uh, uh, in pretty good shape. <clears throat> she says, when father would meet the prophet, they would both roll their fists at each other and the prophet would say, who is the best man? Now rolling their fists, I don't really know what that means. I'm guessing it's doing one of these things. So. Uh, I know that uh, I'm sure he never fought the prophet, but uh, I don't know how that would turn out. But anyway, <coughs> thanks for stopping by. I hope you uh, uh, enjoyed the, those stories. Uh, the fact that she wanted to record that for her posterity, uh, I commend her for writing that down. And uh, uh, if you go into uh, Family Search, you can see some other stories that are in there as well as some notes that uh, even in recounting her stories, they could see that there were some dates that were wrong and some places that actually didn't quite match up with, with the way that they happened. But uh, I think the, the sense is that this is a woman who sacrificed a great deal uh, on behalf of uh, her faith and her testimony and definitely a, uh, an indication of the level of commitment that she had for the prophet, for the church, and for the Lord. So I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks for stopping by, and uh, we'll look forward to sharing another story next time. Thanks a lot.